Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to Old Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for being here. And if you've been here before, you know we have always questioned authority, and that doesn't just extend to the usual suspects, you know, the government, the church, the corporations. We question all kinds of authority. And our guest this time around has been doing exactly that, but he's taken it a step further and turned his attention towards authorities who are part of the O-culture, for lack of a better term. His name is Jason Horsley, and he's recently published a book called Prisoner of Infinity, UFOs, Social Engineering, and the Psychology of Fragmentation. And when I first came across it, that title immediately hooked me. And then when I read the synopsis, I sat back in my chair and said, well, I have to read this. And the best way to introduce what we'll be talking about is to just read that synopsis that hooked me in the first place. Using UFOs and the work of experiencer Whitley Strieber as its departure point, Prisoner of Infinity explores how beliefs are created and perceptions are managed in the face of the inexplicably complex forces of our existence. While keeping the question of a non-human and or paranormal element open, the book maps how all two human agendas, such as the CIA's MKUltra program, have co-opted the ancient psychological process of myth-making, giving rise to dissociative Hollywood versions of reality. Prisoner of Infinity examines modern-day accounts of UFOs, alien abductions, and psychism to uncover a century-long program of psychological fragmentation, collective indoctrination, and covert cultural, social, and mythic engineering. And that is the synopsis of Prisoner of Infinity. In addition to this book, Jason has authored seven previous books with another one coming in early 2019 that builds on his work from Prisoner of Infinity. Jason also hosts his own podcast called The Liminalist and also has a blog called Autoculture, which is a portmanteau of autism and culture. The autism portion of that is an interesting angle here too, and we do talk a bit about that right up front. Really, this is one of the more interesting pieces of research I've read, and Jason is one of the more interesting people I've met since I've started doing this. And this conversation will ruffle a few feathers, and his book will ruffle a few feathers as well, and already has. Apparently, he's too skeptical for Skeptico, which I find pretty hilarious, actually. There's a Patreon extension here, too, another 30 minutes with Jason. More on that after the chat, which might not be an easy one to get through. This might not be for you. But if you are sticking around, don't say I didn't warn you. And if you are, let's open our subtle ears, slap on our discernment caps, and welcome Jason Horsley into the house for some open-minded, sonically transmitted discourse. Enjoy! Jason Horsley, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ryan. So before we get into your book, I do think it's worth mentioning that you are autistic, and that seems to me, like a a fairly new part of the general human experience. I was born in 83, and I don't ever recall hearing that word when I was growing up, to be honest. But in the last, I don't know, maybe 15 or so years, it seems to be everywhere. And I know that it's, it's just your experience. It's not necessarily abnormal. It's just different. But how would you characterize that experience? And how has it sort of led you to where you are in your life right now? You know, like producing your podcast and your blog and your books? Well, there's a uh, short answer and a long answer there. And the the short answer has more to do with how I chose to take the label of autistic. The long answer is, you know, what that means to me. And that relates to what I called extra consensual perceptions, a way of perceiving the world and oneself that doesn't necessarily fit with the consensual view of things. So I always had that experience in that sense. I think as far back as I can remember, I never lost that sense. That doesn't make me autistic, but that is that does correspond with, to some degree, a diagnosis of autism, but mostly more with autistic people's own testimonials about what it is to be autistic, you know, from from their side of things. And it was when I discovered, I began to discover correlations between autistic people's descriptions of their experience and my own that I decided, well that you know might be useful to kind of take on that label it was actually around the same time that i was diagnosed through my own you know volunteering really because i was living in england and i wanted to get disability benefit for a while because i was really feeling not well for uh, most of the time 
I got diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and not, I'm not saying that they're related to those two are related that and autism, but that the experience of actually taking a label of chronic fatigue syndrome helped me to sort of unpack my symptoms or put recontextualize them in the way that made them easier to handle because it had just been really just this amorphous ongoing experience of just something wrong with me. Uh, and so it was similar with autism, like just taking that label helped to kind of narrow down the bandwidth of interpretation of my experience. I don't think it actually can be reduced to that. And the only reason I would say that I chose to self-identify uh, publicly and name my website was that I thought it would be a way to reach other people who were struggling on the spectrum with diagnosis or self-diagnosis that they might be drawn to my work and then be receptive to an alternate description of the condition of autism, which, as I said, is to do with extra consensual perception, just an alternate way of perceiving reality. Yeah, and could you maybe tell people a little bit about your website and your podcast and what sort of areas you explore there? Okay, well, it's, it's autoculture.com, and the main area of activity there is the blog, which is actually autoculture.wordpress.com. I haven't merged them as yet. And uh, the podcast, which is autoculture.com slash liminalist, it's called The Podcast Between, and that's been a weekly thing, uh, barring a brief break I took in Lent for about three years now. It's um, an attempt, an ongoing attempt to engage in dialogues with people. I would say Socratic dialogues, but I think that might be a bit pretentious, particularly since I've hardly read Plato. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of exploratory dialogue, so not interviews, but conversations that have a starting point, but no designated direction or end point. Sometimes they don't even have a starting point, actually. But usually I have something, like you were talking about your notes and stuff. Sometimes I take a bunch of notes. If it's with somebody who has a particularly specific sort of output um, and I'm interested in it, but even on those occasions, I tend not to stick to the notes because a conversation just has its own momentum. So that was the basic idea behind that. And it was centered around the concept of liminality, which is the threshold between things. So in this sense, specifically, the threshold between you and I, we're talking, it's not limited. Like the conversation is a synthesis of you and I. So it's a third thing that's neither you nor me, nor even just the combination of both of us, but this weird interface that occurs. You could you know, The obvious analogy would be, uh, you know, conception, a man and woman to come together, they create a child. Well, that child is more than just a synthesis of, you know, the man and woman. It's actually this third thing that exists unto itself. And I, I would see conversations like that. And, and also my output is, is very much like that with hindsight, like I've, I've looked for subject matter, invariably anomalous subject matter, subject matter that the consensus or the mainstream tends to ignore or dumb down and simplify into incoherence, like the UFO thing, and engage in a dialogue with it as a subject, see what it has to say. That was how Prisoner of Infinity actually began as a dialogue with Jeffrey Kripal, and then a dialogue with Whitley Strieber's work, because I couldn't dialogue with Strieber himself. I just would read his work and then respond to it. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned my notes. <laughs> That's My notes here are a bit more, I guess, I don't know, random and scattered than they normally would be. So I kind of involuntarily or subconsciously fit your format, maybe, of your podcast, where it's just, I don't know where this conversation is going to go. And to be honest, I'm kind of just excited about that for once, because I usually do have a very nice, uh, not necessarily a script, but just a, a nice flow prepared for everything. But here, there's so many areas to explore that I'm just kind of like, well, it goes wherever it goes. So, but mm -hmm. you did mention your book. It's, uh, you have a really interesting book out called Prisoner of Infinity, UFOs, Social Engineering, and the Psychology of Fragmentation. And I think the best place to start with that is by giving the listeners a brief summary of what your book is about and why you wrote it, because I think that will really tell us more about who you are and where you come from and what you've been through. And you already mentioned a bit about what it is with your dialogue with Kripal and then your sort of dialogue with the work of Whitley Strieber. But please do give us more of the of the what and the why, if you don't mind. All right. Well, I'll try and I'll try and relate it to the things I was just saying. You know, there's the thing about how the brain can't 
let go of anomalies. If the brain encounters an anomaly, if it can't figure it out, it can't just file it away. So it, it has to keep going back to it until it figures it out. And that, that's part of our predatorial programming, I think, is because an anomaly might actually be a threat. So we have to, you know, just keep referring back to it until we're absolutely sure that it's not a threat. And then we can just file it away, even if it's unknown. At least we've determined enough about it that we know it's not threatening. I don't think it's limited to that, but I think that that's part of the dynamic that, that unfolded with Prisoner Infinity was that I was wrestling with this anomaly or this series of anomalies around Whitley Strieber and his work, which, of course, you could extend outward to the anomaly of UFOs. Obviously, anyone who's researched UFOs will know that it's a process of just confronting anomalies and trying to solve them and reconcile contradictions endlessly and seemingly a thankless and futile task. Well, I wasn't that ambitious, although I did write about UFOs in, in my book, Lucid View, and try to some extent to flatten it out. But when it came to Whitley Strieber himself, like I was personally very involved in his writing and it, it influenced me deeply at a formative age, like my mid twenty, early 20s. And it had provided a framework for anomalous experiences in my own past, which would relate to autism in terms of like perceiving aspects of reality that I couldn't comprehend or make coherent as a child. Nightmares, night visions, night sweats, night terrors. And when I read Strieber, I began to reconfigure those memories in the context of his abduction narrative and tentatively decide, oh, well, those must have been sort of screen memories or fragments of memories of an abduction and so on. And so his work, it definitely had great meaning for me during this period. And then at a certain point, well, over time, I suppose, I began to discover more and more anomalies in his work, his presentation, his arguments, his descriptions. They weren't, they didn't add up. And then that really came into full form when I heard uh, Strieber on a podcast. For some reason, for years, I'd never listened to Dreamland. And uh, I was just really shocked by his tone of voice, his manner of speaking, because I, you know, when we read someone, we tend to hear their voice and even have this fuzzy image of how they might look. We might not mm. be able to say exactly what it is, but if we see a picture of that person and then hear their voice, we will feel a certain dissonance that lets us know that we did have some prior impression. So that was super intensified with Strieber, not, not his image. I don't remember that creating dissonance, but his voice, it just seemed as though this was a completely different person to the person that I'd connected to through the writings. Anyway, so that began this process of trying to map the anomalies and the inconsistencies and the contradictions in Strieber's oeuvre. And that began in 2008 and uh, continued sort of on and off for about three or four years. And then in 2013, I got this email from Jeffrey Kripal. I can't remember why he sent it to me, but it was an essay called The Traumatic Secret about Georges Bataille and Whitley Strieber and the Hadron Collider, making an argument that trauma, extreme trauma, was related to experiences of enlightenment, heightened awareness, and so forth. And I found that this thesis was not convincing, let's say, or I found it was somehow threatening to bring it back to this idea of an anomalous threat. And, and so I began to argue it with Kripal, but we didn't get anywhere with that. So then I continued the argument, you know, my blog and you know, in my own head, so to speak. And that was the genesis of Prisoner Infinity. It, it began as a response to Kripal, and then there's a blog post or an essay about his essay. And then because he included Strieber, I began to look at Strieber again, revisiting Strieber. There was actually one other element, just to sum it up very briefly. There was this website called Mother Strangled, which was defending Strieber and attacking me and my persona of Aeolus Cephas, sort of in the same breath. It wasn't really attacking me for going after Strieber, but it was. It both had an interest in Strieber and in defending his work and in attacking me. And I, I've never been attacked publicly online. I mean, before or since, that was pretty much a, a once-only thing. And so obviously it got my attention. And... Um, that sort of combined right about exactly the same time in inspiring me to go back to Strieber's material. And this time, it telescoped out 
partly because my wife got involved and was researching the things that I was writing. And so I would find an artifact that seemed to be a clue, like changing images of man, for example, and Willis Harmon and the Aquarian conspiracy and the sort of social engineering of the New Age movement. Obviously, that's a huge subject in and of itself. But I would just be touching on these as points on my way, I thought, to my conclusion. But my wife would then do some research and she would send me this inundate me with these emails of these different links and so it just kept expanding and expanding and expanding and as a result what began as an essay response to Kripal's own essay expanded into I guess a four, about a four-year project and the book that you read. Yeah, and in the book you said that this book is about delving into the experience and the psychology of one high-profile experiencer, that's obviously Whitley Strieber, but you also said it, it's about observing closely the observer himself, and then through that you also observe yourself throughout the book too. It's very personal, very autobiographical on some level. Mm. So I thought I found that to be really curious, and maybe we can get more into that later. Obviously, but you also well, said yeah, that, no, I mean, oh, good, right. good for you for bringing that out because I, I I just skipped over it in my summation. Essentially, that was what was what I discovered really was driving me in writing that book was using Streber and his narratives as, as a mirror to go deeper into my own psychological configuration and you know why I'd been drawn to him in the first place. Absolutely. Right, yeah. And you also said that the book is also for anyone interested in how beliefs are created, how they influence our perceptions and shape the narratives that engender our beliefs. And that mm. really is why I enjoyed the book so much. It's why I gravitated toward it to begin with. Well, actually, that might be a lie. The title is what pulled me in first, actually, you know, especially the bit about the psychology of fragmentation. So I, I guess I came for the title and I stayed for the, uh, I don't know, the psycho philosophy, maybe. I do want to point out, too, something else you said, and this will really open this story up because we haven't mentioned anything about this yet, but I do want to quote you here. In the process of taking a more nuanced and depth psychological look at Streber's alien contact experiences, I, you, have somehow wound up mapping the underground nexus of mind-controlled assassins, child sex rings, satanic cults, and celebrity murder. And then you ask yourself, or you ask the reader, maybe, how has this happened? So mm. I'm going to pose that same question to you. How has this happened, Jason? But also, why do you think this narrative has happened to you? Why do you think it came through your pen here? Mm. Well, those two questions are certainly related. I think they're also related to one of the reasons the UFO problems remained unsolved or even unmapped uh, because of areas that it does lead into if, if a person really ventures you know intrepidly enough and without prejudice so it eventually does end up in these areas i think that that is categorically true and you can only avoid that by by actually avoiding you know the clues that lead you into those areas but as as far as why me why it ended up coming out of my pen that is a almost a separate thing if it can be separated and it, it speaks back to the point that you you raised before that that Prisoner of Infinity is autobiographical and that what was really driving me to write it and to understand Strieber and the UFO and all of that was an unconscious need that was gradually becoming conscious to uncover my own psychological trauma, wounding, imprinting uh, by the culture that I was raised in. And I'm very tentative to be too explicit here, although I have written a book that is coming out this year after, you know, as a follow-up to Prisoner of Infinity that definitely does get more explicit in terms of my own family's, my own family history and how it overlaps not with UFOs, but with organized child abuse and occultism and, and, and those kind of things. And I had no idea about that. I really had no idea. Even though I grew up in this environment, I did not ever suspect that that might be the reason that I was drawn from my 20s on to explore these errors and why I found them so compelling. I'm trying to remember what your question was now because I feel like I didn't quite... Oh, yeah, how does a UFO link to these things? Well, I guess the whole book is the answer to that, so I'm not sure if I can give a short answer to that. I'm not sure if I should. What do you think? Well, I mean, if you don't want to, that's fine. Well, I mean, the short answer is to do with psychology of fragmentation, which is to say that trauma, applied trauma, well, applied or unapplied trauma leads to dissociation. 
and dissociation entails entering into alternate realities that are either entirely hallucinatory or psychic or both i would say both and uh, the psychic domains that are accessible to us through psychedelics which is i'd say self-traumatizing and on a low level or through more extreme kinds of physical or sexual trauma as children at least i don't know i guess it works as adults you have these occultists who do all these weird rituals and so on those psychic realms anyway they are um well, they have a reality unto themselves and they also seem to be inhabited in some strange sense by apparently autonomous entities. So so I would say that that's the underlying reality to the UFO phenomenon is uh, and why it relates to trauma and thereby to mind control and child abuse. Yeah, and, you know, I do want to get into the actual... I guess what I would call the the surface level narrative of the book because it's fascinating to solve the details that you've uncovered and presented here. But I think we should define some terms up front yeah. because they may pop up or they may just give more context to the listener as to what we're talking about. And the first one, the one I really liked in the book that you laid out up front was what you call crucial fiction. I was wondering if you could just define that term for us and tell us how it relates to not only UFO phenomena, but to the greater subject of psychic phenomena. Right. Yeah. Well, that, well, that was the key term. That was the prototype for Prisoner of Infinity was a website, which I call Crucial Fiction. So you're right in zeroing in on that. So it's like the central thesis of the work, really. And the obvious pun on crucifixion. Mm -hmm. It's intentional in terms of relating to belief, but also in terms of the actual act of being crucified, like one is pinned, one is defined in this way by by the four directions as opposed to get esoteric, but by by physical matter. And a crucial fiction in a maybe maybe I'm overreaching a bit, but in a somewhat similar sense, a crucial fiction, let's say that it's the narrative that we cobble together as children using a combination of cultural influences that we find in some way benevolent or benign or that help us to help to relieve the tension of the more negative aspects and our own internal psychic defenses or resources. So uh, it's sort of like a, a semi-waking dream. Like imagine how, well, you don't have to imagine, you know, when we fall asleep, we enter into these dream narratives and to some extent, or to a large extent even, those dream narratives are restorative. They're an attempt to restore balance to our psyche, to resolve tensions and to, you know, provide information and so on and so forth. Well, a crucial fiction is something we assemble, I would say, pretty much as unconsciously as, as we dream dreams, but we do it while we're conscious as well. So we do it in terms of the beliefs and the values and the opinions and the preferences that we adopt quite early on the cultural artifacts, you know, the books and the movies and all this stuff, the way that we define ourselves as individual as individuals. So it's like the crucial fiction is kind of the matrix that we semi-consciously assemble and have assembled for us within which grows an identity, a personal identity self, an ego, really. And to the extent that our crucial fiction was spun together as a defense against trauma, the the personal identity that forms or crystallizes inside that matrix will be a defended identity. It will be like a negative identity that's that's configured in, in reaction against, in opposition to what we perceive as a hostile environment, rightly. So, but bringing it back to the crucial fiction and the point about it, uh, the main point about it being that, like our beliefs, they're all, they might seem to be sort of somewhat separate and somewhat volitional and so but if they're all nested in this larger construct or complex that is our our own internal dominant narrative that maintains order in our life internal order and also external order insofar as it allows us to act in the world then any one of those beliefs if it's pulled on too much will threaten to destabilize the whole structure so that that's what makes the fiction crucial is like we might be able to look at any of the individual beliefs and say, well, yeah, that could be true, or it could be false, that could be fiction, it could be non-fiction. But we might think we can. But we can't look at the whole construct and say, well, yeah, I, I could be a fiction. We can say it theoretically, but you know, we can't really act it or live it, at least until we start deconstructing that, that narrative. So, so that was what 
I was doing with Prisoner Infinity was I was uncovering, I thought, the ways in which Strieber's narrative was his crucial fiction. Not the original one, because the original one would have happened when he was a child, but actually Strieber's adult crucial fiction by which he created this ministry and this uh, success as a best-selling author and all that can be sourced back to his early childhood, even in his own narrative, which is one of the things that makes it so interesting, in that he was being traumatized and he had this experience of the visitors coming and rescuing him. I would say that was a crucial fiction for Whitley the child. He was being traumatized, so he dissociated into this realm in which he was not in his body, so he didn't experience the things that were happening to his body. And there he encountered these visitors. And so thereafter, it became crucial for him to maintain the fiction that these visitors were real. And by which I don't mean to say that they're not real entirely, but that they're not as real. They're not real enough to have rescued him from physical trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you do say that, that these crucial fictions are ways for the collective psyche to deal with the unknown, and they, they turn these things like UFOs into something familiar, you know, using familiar images and words and beliefs and concepts, and then that makes these fictions quote-unquote real, whatever that means, at least in a partial sense, because, as you said, they generate their own evidence. Mm-hmm. And that, I assume you mean by that, is just the personal experience that you're having with this sort of phenomena. And, you know, as you're talking about this in the book, too, you mentioned that most people alive now grew up in a culture where things like UFOs are part of the very fabric of it, really. And all the UFO lore, for example, has been embedded into the generations who are here on Earth right now. And you wrote that, quote, even those who disbelieve in it disbelieve in something they once believed in as kids. And That struck me pretty hard, actually, because I used to think, for example, that UFOs and whoever was piloting them came from someplace else. But I have since grown out of that belief. And you went through a similar phase, you said, around the age of 40, which you also note is the age that Carl Jung says that you turn your attention from the outer world to the inner world. Uh, But you became more interested in in the psychological component to this, and I'm right there with you. And on this, you also presented a, a simple and concise thesis statement, which is this. Quote, the UFO in all its manifestations emerges from the human psyche itself and in secondary but no less significant ways in and through the body. End quote. So, could you elaborate on that thesis statement for us? What do you mean by it's emerging not only from the psyche itself but also in and through the body? I found that to be pretty interesting. Well, one thing that's coming to mind to my rescue because I really wasn't sure if I had an answer is something I touch on later on in the book, which is the the phenomenon of stigmata, which, as I'm sure you know, is like Christian, devout Christians who experience the emergence of Christ's wounds on their body through the, whatever we could say, the intensity of their belief. You know, how does that happen, if it does happen? You know, let's take it as a, as a fact, even though we probably haven't verified it. But I think that there are other there's more evidence than just stigmata that, that hypnosis, for example, can cause physiological changes that would seem actually impossible to us if, you know, physical reality was as cut and dried as as rationalists like to think, and if the mind and the body were, were these entirely separate spheres of being. I probably should interject at this point that psyche isn't a synonym for the mind, but for the soul, but perhaps because of our secularization most people tend to think of the psyche as the mind or you know as a synonym for the mind which is a mistake i would say that the the mind is an aspect of the body a function of the body that has developed a sort of quasi autonomy whereas the psyche is closer to the the source of the body in the sense in that it pre-exists the body in some way but i mean that might be quite a, a large esoteric summation just to mention in passing but it does seem relevant to if I attempt to answer this question. So then with trauma, in terms of what we t- what I was talking about, that trauma causes dissociation as a defense mechanism in children, also adults, but it's much more acute in children, when things are happening to the body that the child is not psychologically uh, strong enough to process. It, it just can't make sense of what's happening. Then uh, it means that because the, the person dissociates, they're actually not present for what's happening. So that's sort of a vicious circle because they dissociate because it's too much to process, but because they've dissociated, they really can't process it because they're not there for it. So what happens is it just goes all the way into the body and then gets stored there in the unconscious. And I think that this, I mean, to bring it back to stigmata, that 
there are realities the realities that are too great for us to process or understand go straight into the body and as such they they possess us it's like it's actually and i mean i'm just kind of formulating this right now because you asked me such a difficult question even though you're quoting my words but it's actually interesting in comparison or parallel with many of the ufo narratives which are about walk-ins now and, and and possessions and hybrids and all this a lot of the abduction narrative has to do with these alien beings intruding in the body they have you have two main aspects one is the ufo takes the abductee away inside a ufo so the body gets put inside something alien and then there's the abduction experience itself, or rather, you know, the interaction experience, which is often the alien putting something into the body of the human. So that's kind of a somewhat viscerally describes what I was describing in more psychological terms, that something comes to us from the outside, it completely engulfs us. It's, it's, so, it's too large for us to escape it. So we get abducted by it, but we dissociate, we go into this dream realm, and uh, as a result of that, we come away with something that's actually been implanted in our body, which is like the memory of the trauma. So you say that the psyche and the body are the twin poles of human existence. And I'm wondering then, do you see psyche and body as two individual distinct things? Or do you think that they are joined together in some way? You know, in some sort of like esoteric schools of thought, there's this sort of like oneness approach where mind and body or psyche and body are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just how do you see this then? Well, I think it's a, it's a relevant question to the thesis and the conversation, because I think that, that that's the optimal arrangement, and that what we call enlightenment or even salvation or grace is when, and Blake wrote about this, when the body becomes indistinguishable from the soul the body is understood to be indistinguishable from the soul or the psyche that it is one manifestation let's say and the trauma-based mind control and i would say the ufo experience i would say occultism i'm going to displease many of your listeners uh, psychedelics all of these things are geared towards the opposite they're geared towards propagating, intensifying, continuing the split between the psyche and the body, like driving a wedge between it. Not that it wasn't already there to begin with, because we have this, you know, the Christian narrative of the fall, like something happened. We can, we can probably all agree on that, that something went wrong in terms of the human experience of him or herself in relation to, to God and the environment or both, whatever, depending on your belief system. But nature existence you know it's fraught with suffering and disconnect and alienation and all these things so we don't really know how it happened this split between the psyche and the body but it's my view that there are many many practices which which claim and perhaps even believe to be attempting to bring harmony between the two but actually intensify the split and i think that this is where my central disagreement with Greipel's thesis lies is that he was talking about something other than bringing the, the psyche and the body into harmony something closer to what mind control is about which is something i have a very difficult time describing but it's essentially i think to do with what i've already tried to describe which is using trauma to create a surrogate self a dissociated surrogate self that is has access to psychic powers and psychic realms and thereby experiences itself as well enlightened or somehow empowered but is not somehow that empowerment you can think of an out-of-body experience for example like astral projection yeah that to our mental self to our ego self that seems like a superpower that seems like we're becoming more spiritual if we're learning astral projection i did for years but if you look at the actual specifics of it, astral projection is about separating the something from the body. It's hard to say what, but the conscious mind, let's say, is separating itself from the body and zipping around the universe. Well, I would say that in my own experience anyway, but also based on readings I've done of other writers, you know, and occultists who followed that path, that although it does provide a sort of supercharged experience of psychic realms for the ego it intensifies the split and the disconnect from the body and so actually doesn't lead to wholeness at all yeah so there's so much depth here but i really want to get into the actual narrative of the book now because the events that you lay out here and the connections that you make 
are, you know, sort of mind-blowing, if I could use that term loosely here. And I think the best place to start is you mentioned this uh, changing images of man. You sort of name-dropped that uh, several minutes ago, and that's a report that came out, I believe, in the early 70s from the Stanford Research Institute, which that group, the SRI, has a, a bit of a connotation, especially in conspiracy theory circles. It's always under question, like, what sort of work is this group really doing, and is it is it beneficial for us, and whatever. But you did mention this Changing Images of Man report that was actually turned out to be commissioned by the U.S. Department of Education, which is odd to me. But this report had some interesting information in it about the New Age movement. What did you find when you dug into that report? Well, to be honest, I haven't dug as deeply in it as I need to to really answer that question. I dug as deeply as I needed to to write the book. And as I said, it was one of many clues. So because they just kept coming, I didn't feel I had time to stay too much on changing images of man. But the main indication of that book for me was that the New Age movement, and by extension, modern spirituality, was deemed a useful and even necessary area for those who want to direct the course of society and maintain or reinforce the, the dominant structures within society to invest in, to give their attention to, and to employ as a tool for social engineering. So it's actually it's bringing me back to a point I was going to mention earlier when you said about UFOs and you know how we were all raised to sort of believe in them. And there's this point that Jordan Peterson made, which I'm investigating him currently, <laughs> I have to put it that way, investigating him and looking <laughs> at the good and the bad in, in his work and uh, in relation to changing images of man even. But he, one of the good points he makes, I think, is, is that religion is your your religion isn't determined by what you say you believe or even what you think you believe, but how you act. And that all of us are acting within a Ju Judeo-Christian context of belief, even if we reject those beliefs consciously. That the certain tenets that he draws attention to, that we take for granted, we don't realize that they're sourced in Judeo-Christianity. So we don't have to consciously believe them because we've been, already been indoctrinated and encultured to act as if they were true. And so the, the same is true, I think, of the UFO. Obviously, it's a more recent paradigm. But nonetheless, as I pointed out in the book, most of us alive today were raised in an environment in which that imagery and those narratives were just everywhere. And so we're sort of carrying around and acting out a certain belief or set of beliefs around this. For example, that the galaxy is you know, inhabited by other beings and that they're probably interacting with us like even if we don't really believe that at a conscious level I and mean, if you ask most people what ufos what they think about ufos they'll say yeah i believe in them and when they say that i don't know if it's most people actually but i think it probably is but a lot of people anyway, they'll say that they believe in them without even saying what do you mean by ufo and when they say they believe in them they don't just mean they believe they exist but that they believe that they're coming from other planets you know that they're extraterrestrials from other planets so that belief is very widespread. And what I look at in Prisoner Infinity is the ways in which those beliefs and other sort of intersecting beliefs may have been employed or indoctrinated into us through the culture, through the mass media, fiction and non-fiction, primarily fiction, I think. Although in the case of the New Age movement, it's definitely a fuzzy area, uh, channeled works, all of these things, with a conscious aim in mind to shape our behaviors let's say to shape our behaviors in such a way that they would keep afloat the dominant social political structures i mean a, a really good guy to look at here is william sims bainbridge who i touch on in the book and he writes about audience cults he's a pentagon guy and he researched the process church he's a transhumanist he sort of researches various different fields that don't seem to be connected ufos also and his interest in, U in, in UFOs was as an audience cult and based on the premise that if you can create audience cults, then you can direct them towards useful ends within society. Like you have a sense of a certain demographic within society. You know what language you, they speak. You know how to sell them the things you want to sell them, speaking metaphorically, and you know how to motivate them and inspire them. So really, actually a really easy example is that 
the notion of space colonization was seeded in the populace as a means to provide people with hope and a belief in the capitalist system that it had a purpose and meaning. So I don't think it was necessary for those people who are disseminating the ideas about space colonization to believe that space colonization was possible or even desirable. It was only necessary that they believe that getting others to believe in it would help motivate people to keep going to work, you know, to keep inventing new technologies, to keep supporting the capitalist system by giving them this scientific version of heaven to keep people moving forward. So that that's just one example, right? So I think that the New Age movement can be looked at in those terms too as a, as a largely cynical ploy to give people a sort of synthesized meaning, religion and the opium of the masses, right? But I think that real religion is a threat to the controlling system. So if you just look at Christianity, actually, if you look at the Gospels, it says sell all your stuff and give the money to the poor. It's it's really hardline. It's radical. I mean, beyond radical. It's just kind of, in, you know, we can't even imagine trying to live by those principles. But the New Age movement, on the other hand, is very materialist friendly, even has God as materialist force, really. Think of Star Wars and the force. That's that's basically a synthesis of science and mysticism. And, you know, the secret, there's all these different New Age threads that really let people have their cake and eat it. They let them feel like they're living spiritual lives while at the same time getting to continue living their same lives of convenience and consumerism and, and at both depending on the capitalist structures and, you know, doing what's necessary to maintain them. Yeah, and you mentioned that they did this through Freemasonry was like I think the most prominent example of it, you know, because you always hear so much about how the founding of the United States was really rooted in Freemasonry, you know, all the founding fathers were Freemasons and then you have all the the Freemason symbols in DC and then on the dollar bill and all that sort of stuff and you actually said that and this is from the Changing Images of Man of special interest to the Western world is that the Freemasonry tradition, which played such a significant role in the birth of the United States of America, attested to by the symbolism of the Great Seal on the back of the dollar bill, in this version of the transcendental image, the central emphasis is on the role of creative work in the life of the individual. In true Freemasonry, there is one lodge, the universe, and one brotherhood, which is everything that exists. Each person has the privilege of labor, of joining with the great architect in building more noble structures and thus serving in the divine plan. Thus, this version of the new transcendentalism, perhaps more than other versions imported from the East more recently, has the potentiality of reactivating the American symbols, reinterpreting the work ethic, supporting the basic concepts of a free enterprise democratic society, and providing new meanings for the technological industrial thrust, which is what you were just talking about. And then you say, what this quote suggested to me, to you, was that organized spirituality or new transcendentalism has been co-opted or even created as a means to prop up and inject new life into the Western capitalist system. While it referred specifically to Freemasonry, what were the chances that other spiritual and or magical doctrines had been similarly seated as carriers for an anything but spiritual movement? And that's a really, really, really important question to ask. And I think it's important to question this just as much as it's important to question, like, is the story of the Bible, of Jesus, is that real? Is that a crucial fiction? You know, and it probably is on some level. So I do like mm -hmm. that you were that you were able to question this and, and bring this into your book because it really spoke to me. And it, it spoke to me on the level of I question everything no matter what it is, but it spoke to me on a personal level like, I do feel like, man, that I've been through this sort of faux spiritual awakening the last few years of my life where when I meet like-minded people, they consider what they're going through to be very spiritual, but we're going through a similar process of in terms of the way we're thinking, and they're describing it as spiritual. And I've been on record on this podcast, man, and I, I don't mean to keep talking so much here, but I've said this many times, both in private and on the show here, that I don't consider what I'm going through to be spiritual in any way. It's just a different way of thinking and viewing the world. So I don't know if I have a question here. I don't really have any question. I guess I'm just sort of rambling. So if you have any no, response to that. it's good to hear it because, I mean, I did wonder, like when you invited me on the podcast, I said yes right away because that's my nature. But then afterwards I thought, well, I looked at a previous guest and I thought, oh, well, and in the title, obviously, this guy's into the occult. 
most of his guests probably seem to be into the occult. Most of his listeners will be. You know, I'm not really going to be saying anything anyone wants to hear. But then I thought, well, actually, in a way, that's probably the best audience to be addressing in, in some ways. So, yeah, it's good to know that you're, you're, you're more than open to, to my perspective. Because, you know, I, I don't think that anyone could say that I didn't go as deeply into occultism as, as it's necessary to go to have a really informed opinion about it. Like, you can look at some of my podcasts and, and some of my blog posts to find out for yourself how deeply I went into it, but a lot deeper than I wish I had. And to the point of identifying not just with Crowley, but with Iwas and Horus and Lucifer and getting tattoos and the whole nine yards, except fortunately, you know, no horrific, violent, traumatizing rituals or anything like that. You know, things that actually most people don't even realize that somebody like Crowley got up to or they think it's just Christian hysteria to suggest it. But. What I've discovered, and this is much more, this is laid out in my follow-up book, The Vice of Kings, is that occultism is more or less inseparable from intelligence groups and agencies and programs, one way or another, whichever you're going to make as the, you know, the cause and the effect, they sort of evolved in tandem. And worse still, the, you know, the dark rituals that we associate with satanic rituals and that we think the Christians are just being hysterical for lumping all occultism in that basket. Well, anyone who goes deep enough into occultism has go- is going to encounter that. Like, that that's what the path is. It's the left-hand path. It doesn't mean they're going to do it, of course. But at a certain point, they're either going to just decide to look the other way and pretend they haven't seen what they've seen so they can carry on doing the occult they want, or they're going to to cross the line and, and say, okay, well, the, I did it, you know, I've invested this much, so I guess now I'll sacrifice a cat or whatever it is, right? Or they will they will back the hell away. I don't think there's a third option. It's somehow it's in the nature of the thing because it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a will to power. It's a will to power. To your yeah. point, you know, yeah. like, I think Crowley's the most obvious example here. You know, he has direct ties to British intelligence and that yeah. raises red flags immediately. And then the more you dig into... Other figures in the occult scene, I guess, you do see ties to, I guess, military intelligence and groups like that. So it's important to question that. And, you know, that is part of your book, too. And that when you're talking about Whitley Strieber's life, you know, and and the things that he's been through and the connections that he's made and the people he's came across on his Mm -hmm. path to becoming, you know, this sort of propped up figure, especially in the UFO community. So it's probably a good time to transition more into the story of Whitley himself and what you uncovered as you, you know, dug more into his work from this perspective. So I honestly don't have any idea, and this is why my notes are so scattered, like where the best place is to begin here. So let's Mm. just, I guess, start with the beginning of when you started looking into him, what were the first things or notes that you made that you came across that that raised your your eyebrows, you know, about who this guy may actually be? Well, I think... The best place to start is London in the year 1968. And although I was aware of inconsistencies very early on in discovering Strieber, I didn't go all the way into that nexus until I started Prisoner Infinity. Some part of me probably knew that, you know, I didn't want to enter thoughtlessly into that, that it was going to be the proverbial rabbit hole. But actually, even in Strieber's own works, Communion and Transformation, He himself acknowledges some inconsistencies around this period. I mean, he acknowledges quite a lot. But specifically, there was the Charles Whitman shooting. That wasn't 68. I think that was a couple of years before. I think it was 66. But he flip-flops on that. He's like, he has this clear memory of being at the Charles Whitman shooting. Obviously, this is relevant because Whitman was, he may have been anyway, a mind-controlled assassin, let's say, to use the shorthand. But certainly, obviously, he's one of the most famous killers spree killers in history so obviously that this isn't coincidental that this is one of the central incongruities in, in Strieber's abduction narrative was around this this spree killer Whitman and he yeah he flip-flops from thinking that he was there and even finding somebody who says he was there to realizing that it was just a screen memory without explaining why he would have a screen memory for that anyway but this also ties into the fact that while he was at the University of Texas, supposedly, when Whitman was there, he was also 
at the London Film School in 68, because if he went to the University of Texas in 66 or whatever, he would have still been there in 68. I mean, pretty sure it's all the supposed facts that Stuber presents that indicate that he was at the, the University of Texas, the London Film School, and the London School of Economics. Well, he doesn't mention the London School of Economics, but he's listed among their alumni. And the London School of Economics is a Fabian organization which is tied to social engineering, you know, so crowd psychology and research, sexual research and Tavistock and that whole thing, which I get into my follow-up book. So that, I mean, even unto itself, that's an interesting fact that he was at the London School of Economics. But anyway, how did he manage to go to three colleges or graduate from three different colleges in the same year? That, <laughs> as far as I know, multiple personality doesn't allow for trilocation. But anyway, that that's in his biography. So... I think partly because of that, I zeroed in on 1968, which was the year he spent in London. It was also the year that he flashed back to when he was hypnotized by Bud Hopkins the, for, uh, the second time, I think, after the memories came up in 1986 that, that went into the writing of Communion. He sort of spontaneously flashed back to 1968 because this was the year that after he left London, he went to Barcelona and he had this sort of quasi-abduction experience that involved human beings, obviously, but also being drugged and um, various little details that do suggest like an early abduction experience that had nothing to do with aliens. And so I discovered by looking at this period specifically in London like that Strieber was apparently hanging out at this place called the Pheasantry, where I used to go as a teenager, coincidentally, which is where Eric Clapton had an apartment for a period. And... This was also on the circuit of the Cray twins with their organized crime and child trafficking and stuff that was going on there. And this guy, Litvinov, who is famous for uh, the Chelsea Grin, right? Uh, he was given the Chelsea Grin, rather, by one of the Cray brothers. He was also at the pheasantry during this period. So there's sort of historical links between Strieber's circle at that time and the Cray twins and that whole thing, which is Jimmy Savile. And my God, I mean, that's just an incredible nexus of crime. Can you explain a little bit who the Cray brothers are? And no, I think some people would know who Jimmy Savile is, but you know, just tell us a little bit about who they are and why they are important here. The Cray twins are most known. I mean, there's a couple of movies glorifying them as these, you know, wide boy gangsters in London, sort of the glamour of the gangster life, East End gangster life. But they're of interest to me, not because they were gangsters, but because of who their friends and associates were, because they included uh, people like, Tom Dryberg and Boothby, who was an MP in those days as well, and both of whom were into having sex with children. And uh, the Cray twins were, they've been placed at, I think it's Elm Guest House in the Jersey Care Home, or one of the, one or both of those. But anyway, one of the uh, known locales for child brothels during that period where politicians and celebrities and whatnot would go to have sex with children. So there's a lot of evidence there that the Cray twins were involved in the trafficking of those children for sexual use for high status players in the 60s. And Jimmy Savile also, as we know, was, was part of, of those criminal enterprises and certainly can be placed at Jersey Care Home. And I think Elm Guest has. So that was a very significant link to me as far as, yeah, the, the Cray twins seeming to be linked to more than just organized crime or organized crime. Uh, you know, extending to high-level government and entertainment and and so on and so forth. So anyway, bringing it back to to that nexus, the thing that Strieber was supposedly doing in London during those few months in 68 was studying at London Film School, and his project was a film about the Process Church. Now, anyone who's researched the occult and or conspiracy knows who the Process Church are. They're like one of those strange attractors. It's like you know, research any area of sort of government or occult intrigue for long enough and you'll end up at the doorstep of the Process Church. You can start with Charles Manson. They pop up an awful lot, the OTO, Crowley's thing, the Solar Lodge. They're just somehow, you know, for a relatively small group who didn't seem to have much historical impact, they just seem to pop up in the most unexpected places. Their influence is disproportionate to their supposed, you know, historical significance. And certainly in 1968, they weren't a sort of cultural curiosity. They were an ongoing project. They were in the magazine, uh, the Oz magazine, which had a lot of UFO stuff. And uh, this was the link, actually. 
Martin Sharp was an artist for Oz magazine. This was a countercultural magazine in the 60s in London. And um, they had an article about Jimmy Savile, also in this period, the, the secret life of Jimmy Savile. They had something about the Process Church, and they had uh, stuff about UFOs in there, because I've got you can get them online. And apparently Whitley Strieber was living with Martin Sharp, because he mentions it in his book, Transformation. So that was how I could manage to connect, just through that one name that he gave. I managed to find all these connections that were very telling and that strengthened already existing connections. Well, how did Strieber know about the Process Church and why was he interested in them? Because he was in that circle, apparently, this countercultural kind of mushroom-eating, UFO-worshipping or chasing sex rock and roll sort of circle, which is really unexpected for Whitley Strieber, because anyone who knows him, he's, he seems to be this Texas homeboy who's very square and very conventional, despite his bizarre outre experiences. But anyway, so he was making a film about the Process Church, which no longer exists, but it's there on some of his biographical notes from his early uh, books, which, by the way, also say that he did work in intelligence, feels as diverse as intelligence and film. So allegedly, although Strieber will deny it, the same period that he was working, making a film about the Process Church, he was working for intelligence. He himself talks about the British Home Office, talking to him about the Process Church, and so he was involved in something, that's absolutely certain, just what is really hard to, to, to figure out. And it was right after this period, well, he said he pissed off the Process Church, and then he has these weird memories of running away across rooftops of being chased by their dogs and, and these sort of fragmented memories. And then he left London and he fled London. He didn't just leave, he fled, but he doesn't say why. And then in Barcelona, he describes these encounters I don't think he recounts it in communion, but in his hypnosis session, and the audios are available at his website, he describes meeting this woman, this Irish woman on a train, and the, there were two main people behind the Process Church, and one of them was Scottish, so not that that's synonymous with Irish, but still, I mean, you have to read the book, because there uh, do seem to be some correlations there. But anyway, he met this, 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 this saucy woman on a train in Europe, and she ended up giving him some weird drug that he remembers being like a pomegranate that tasted really bitter and then he went into this fugue state a dissociated state where he remembers being surrounded by this weird group of people and manipulated into having sex with this woman who i guess later he decided was an alien i don't know you know like he streber tends to recalibrate all of his experiences his weird anomalous experiences with human beings in the context of alien abduction Whereas what I've done, I think, more reasonably in Prisoner of Infinity is the reverse, is to recalibrate his supposed experiences of alien abduction in the context of human agencies and you know, manipulations. Not that it's necessarily either or, of course, but I still think it's better to start <laughs> you know, with what we know and what's kind of hist somewhat historically verifiable. So anyway, so that that's really as close to a smoking gun with Strieber as I think there is, besides his own contradictions that he was involved in something distinctly human, distinctly manipulative, and that seemed to seems to be the source until we go back to his very early childhood with something very similar to MK Ultra, the source or the you know the, the sort of beginning point anyway of his his adult experiences of abduction and of alternate reality um, inter interactions. Yeah, you mentioned the pomegranate. I thought that was an interesting detail because uh, you also point out that pomegranates are associated with Persephone's rape in her journey to the underworld. So mm. that's interesting that he would mention that in his visions, I guess, or his... Was that from the hypnotic sessions? I don't remember, but... Uh, yeah, it I think really so, matter. yeah. So I guess, you know, in regards to Strieber's actual visions or experiences, you know, as it relates back to our crucial fiction discussion and what that term actually means do we assume then or should we assume then that what streeper has the narrative that he's presented through his books are those sort of uh engineered cover-ups of some sort to to help sort of usher in this new form of religion or spirituality or is this really just him trying to process trauma that he encountered as a young kid, and he's just doing it through the culture that he was raised in. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I think 
like good questions tend to it, it i think it provides the answer because i think you the either or that you presented is two different ways of describing the same thing so if you want to create cultural figures who will spin narratives that will be useful to programs of social engineering you know to goals the preset goals then you have to give them some freedom you can't just you want them to be good at their job you don't just want them to be parroting stuff that you've written for them partly because you yourself in this you know this this hypothetical social engineering think tank don't have the talent and the wherewithal to create these fictions because the part of us that comes to our rescue when we're traumatized and dissociates and creates these fictions is the most creative part of us. So it's like if you want to create somebody who's going to be a creative force in the culture, then yes, you traumatize them knowing that they will, you know, call upon all of their psychic resources to heal the trauma and to paper over the cracks and to come up with a crucial fiction which will make it possible to deal with those experiences. But that they will do so relying on the culture the cultural signifiers that they've that they're surrounded by so it's kind of both like you're creating the culture partly by creating these individuals but as the culture develops you know being directed here and there by your conscious interventions but basically developing somewhat organically as it as it develops it provides more and more signifiers for future you know cultural figures that you are traumatizing and then covertly backing you know, observing from afar and then providing them the opportunity here and the hand up here and the the break they need there and, you know, the financing and so on. They don't ever have to be witting. I'm talking very hypothetically here because I realize it would sound just like sheer paranoia if I was saying that this is a fact. But as far as trying to hypothesize how this might work, then you have a figure like Strieber. He's been traumatized. He's conjured up the narratives, the crucial fictions that are helping him to deal with the, the trauma. And part of that is the drive to actually present those fictions to others and have them validated so that they will become more concretized and more real to him himself. So he's not only driven to create the fictions, he's driven to to share them, to communicate them, and to establish them in the world and thereby establish himself. And so he'll feel safe within those fictions because the world itself is validating them. So then he's he's looking to the world for validation, not just in terms of how they respond to his fictions, but also how he's assembling the fictions. He's going to use elements that he finds in his culture to construct the fiction. He's going to be influenced by the TV shows, the cartoons, you know, the books that he read as a kid. And Strieber, well, he was, he was born in 47, so that was actually the year of the Flying Saucer sighting you know, the Kenneth Arnold, the famous thing. So he was, he's, it's kind of like year zero, like he's the Jesus Christ of the UFO or something. But, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he was, he wasn't like you or I, I'm obviously older than you, but he wasn't born right into that culture. But it took off pretty fast. I mean, he would have been pretty young, like that image that's on the cover of Prisoner Infinity of the little boy in the, in the flying saucer machine, the the ride that you would just put a nickel in and, and it would bounce around for a while outside the convenience store, whatever that was. That was in the 50s. So that, that indicates how quickly the flying saucer as a, a fiction, quasi-fictional meme to appeal to children, uh, how quickly that took hold of the culture. And so thereby, you know, how, how early Strieber would have been imbibing those artificially created memes because you don't need an artist a cultural pioneer to create a flying saucer slot machine thing joy you know ride outside a convenience store you just need an inventor or whatever a, a, an entrepreneur who wants to make a bit of money being noted in the right direction by those who want to promote flying saucer narratives or maybe they don't even need to be nudged you know maybe you just need one intelligence agent who's Kenneth Arnold, let's say, not to slander his name, it might not have been him, but, you know, who tells a compelling story that captures the imagination. You've got Jung writing Flying Saucers pretty early on, so that recognizes that the UFO is a psychic symbol that's very potent. So actually, you know, you probably don't have to try and too hard to spread it around because it's immediately captivating to the imagination, the human imagination. But anyway, yeah, so you, 
you have these artifacts, comic books that she would have grown up on, the rides and so on. So that's put, that, that becomes part of his tool set when he's clutching for ways to assemble a crucial fiction. I mean, yeah, that's what I mean by well, saying that it could be both, you know, both, both that he was trying to deal with trauma and he was actually being used as a, to, to seed narratives or to spread narratives that were seeded in him. Let me just wrap this up with a personal note here. This book hit me in a spot that I probably haven't been hit in before. And after reading it, I realized that I probably have been suffering from this same sort of psychological fragmentation that you've described here. And obviously, I don't know for how long. I, I don't know. But as long as I can remember, probably, just so there were a few passages in it that, you know, I felt were written like almost specifically for me, even though I know you're writing for a lot of people, hopefully. But when I read those passages, the ones that really spoke to me, I got that, you know, that weird energetic chill up and down my spine, you know, that feeling of resonance. The part about the fake spiritual awakening got me. I really identified with that. But mm -hmm. so did the part about the hysterical phenomena, which is a term we didn't really talk about, but it it is that it's a Freudian idea that relates back to the idea of the stigmata that, that you did mention. I mean, I, I could tell you a great personal story about about that one if we had time. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to, to thank you for writing this book, to be honest, because it, it's not every day that you see these sorts of books come out, obviously, that really do challenge this seemingly like prevalent spirituality that's being discovered by everybody. I, I know that it's sort of a buzzword in the communities that you and I probably interact with. And it's definitely a buzzword on social media. You know, people talk about being woke these days a lot. And I don't know what that term really means, but I, I think it's part of that social engineering where they just sort of commandeered a word that is supposed to mean that you have, you know, sort of graduated to this next level of awareness or consciousness or whatever, spirituality. And it just seems to be silly all of a sudden, you know? It seems to be more of an ironic thing to say than a real thing to say. But mm. I just wanted to tell you, man, that this book definitely was an, an act of courage on your part to question the people who, you know, like, if you asked me before I read this book, would you want to interview Whitley Strieber for your podcast? I'd say, well, yeah, of course. Why not? But I had not mm -hmm. dug into his work as much as, as you obviously have. And then after reading your book, it's sort of reformulated my idea of who he was and what his work is about. Although I, like I told you, man, I don't really believe in UFOs and, and aliens and extraterrestrials as, as external entities. I think they are a product of the psyche on some level or consciousness, maybe. I don't know how you want to word that. But hmm. yeah, so I don't have a question here to wrap this up on. I just wanted to tell you, you know, thank you for writing the book and for letting me talk to you about it for a few minutes here. And I feel like this conversation may have been sort of fragmented at times because I told you my notes were sort of scattered because I wasn't really sure of the order I wanted to go in. But I think that we did touch on some of the high points. And really, I just want to direct people to read the book because I don't think a, a two-hour conversation even can encapsulate everything that's in there and do it justice. So uh, it will be linked in the show notes, obviously, for people that want to read it, buy it as well, obviously. Please do tell people where they can find the book, I suppose, and where they can find more of your work. Well, I just want to throw the thanks back at you because... It was a very nice spiel, and it's really kind of inspiring for me to know that the book even reaches one person, that it was unexpectedly. I could have people I know, they follow my blog and stuff, they're obviously going to read it and enjoy it. But it is a risky enterprise with this book. I mean, it, I don't want to say it was an act of courage exactly, because I, I felt I didn't really have much choice about writing it. But I am aware that it's a message or a, a set of meanings that most people don't want to hear. And I was aware of that talking to you as well, because I said of you know some of the guests on your podcast. So I could throw it back at you that it's an act of courage for you to interview me on this podcast. And that this is definitely one of the most satisfying interviews I've ever had. So I think that you that speaks to how much you received what I was trying to transmit with that book. And that's actually, you know, the best result that I can hope for. As far as how to get it, well, um, you know, the usual places. Like I have been asking people to buy it on Amazon and to review it on Amazon somewhat reluctantly because I know that people rightly have a lot of negative feelings about Amazon 
and I hate to sort of submit to the hegemony, but uh, it has become sort of a an overriding context for a writer to have a sense of how his book's being received and to to try and amplify that signal. So if you'd have no objections to Amazon on principle, then I'd say yeah, just just buy it on Amazon and please, if you like the book, review it because the more reviews that it gets, the you know the more it gets pushed up there in the results. And I'm not expecting to make a lot of money off this book, but I would like it to reach readers like yourself who are going to benefit from it. Um, and I do feel that there's it's like there's an awful lot of noise that this book is trying to address by being a signal in the noise. That's a bit of a clumsy metaphor, but I mean, it's, it feels very easy that it would be very easy for this book to just get drowned out and ignored because the, there seems to be such a concerted effort to push the same narratives that this book is attempting to deconstruct. Definitely, yeah. And remind people where they can find your blog. Okay, so if you just go to Auticulture, that's like autism joined together with culture, A-U-T-I culture.com. There's a link there also to my blog and to my podcast. So basically everything you need to know about me is there pretty much. At least if you've got like a few hundred hours to go through it. <laughs> Definitely, man. Well, hey, Jason, I appreciate your time. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Take care. You too. See ya. Bye. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jason Horsley. And at the risk of not repeating what I said in the intro, what an interesting and thought-provoking piece of writing and research here. I called it courageous, and maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but I think it's definitely a necessary work. At least it was for me personally. You know, I think it's important to question the institutions, the leaders, the teachers, and the teachings that we believe in. And that actually begins and ends with ourselves. It's not just restricted to external sources like the church or the state or any sort of occulted belief systems. It's more about asking yourself, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do what I do? And is this a product of my capital S self or has this been thrust upon me unknowingly? And I think this is important because I found the occult, these occult teachings and belief systems during my own traumatic experience. I was in a really dark place and this world opened up to me. And some of you may remember from previous episodes that I've asked multiple guests if they found the occult through trauma or if they thought others found these teachings and systems, you know, during or after traumatic experiences. And in hindsight, I guess I was trying to better understand why or how I found myself suddenly thrust into this during my own trauma. And to be honest, I had a bit of trauma recording and editing this. I really struggled with this episode. I kept questioning myself about why I recorded an interview with someone whose work calls into question some of the ideas we may be interested in and calling into question some of the people who may be looked at as authorities in these fields. I was worried some of you may be turned off by this one and considered just trashing it altogether. But honestly, I've had some experiences on social media recently, on Instagram specifically, where a couple people have been offended by some posts that I've made to promote my episodes here. To borrow a theme that ties into this chat with Jason, I guess I triggered a fragment of their psyche. Some people apparently get offended by images of cartoon frogs. And my response to that was, well, okay, I'm glad you're offended. It's not bad to be offended. It's actually, to me, facing parts of yourself that need to be integrated somehow. You know, offensive and shocking and grotesque, things that scare you, things that you're afraid of. I mean, these are necessary aspects of the human experience. Of course, you may be able to filter your news feed so you can only see what you agree with, but are you really embodying the whole when you're only experiencing one or two specific fragments of reality? I don't think so. And it's important to remember that you don't have to agree with everyone. And you don't have to completely disagree with someone because you don't like one viewpoint or idea they have. Someone on Instagram complained about me posting an image that spoke to this filtered algorithmic reality that social media has created for us. And they complained that the person who made the original image had posted some other images with messages that they disagreed with. And I'm just thinking, well, you know, I didn't post those images. I'm not even sure which images this person was referring to. But if those images offended you, or those messages did, or you disagree with those ideas, that's, that's fine. But that doesn't mean another idea from the same person is automatically disqualified or devalued or dismissed. And of course, there's no actual discourse about this on social media. It's just a bunch of smartphone warriors trying to force their views onto everyone else without any critical thought, without any critical feeling, 
which I'm not sure is a thing, but I kind of see that as the, the heart or maybe the gut equivalent of critical thinking. So I guess my point is, I went through with this episode because Jason thinks differently, because his experience has been different, and because that's okay. I mean, if you want equality for everyone, if you tolerate everyone's beliefs, no matter how different they are than yours, I mean, that literally applies to everyone. That does not apply to only the people you agree with. And I may not agree with everything Jason thinks or says, but that doesn't mean I'm going to completely dismiss his own experience. And I hope you don't either. I told Jason, you know, if I had a chance prior to this to interview Whitley Strieber, I'd take it. He probably wouldn't be interested now, and I'm okay with that because I'm not that interested in it anymore, to be honest. And there was something, I guess, just pushing me to challenge myself here, and maybe on some level to challenge you as well. You know, are we thinking and feeling critically about the things we believe in? Are we challenging ourselves? Are we taking the same approach to what we think is true or real as we are to the things we don't think are true or real? And what I mean by that is, are we being just as skeptical about whatever we believe in as we are about the beliefs of others who don't align with our views? It's easy to ridicule something like, say, Christianity, and do what we can to debunk it because we see how it's a control mechanism, but do we also take that same approach towards UFOs or aliens? A lot of us want that to be true. I did at one time. But doesn't that inherently make us biased towards anything that contradicts our belief in it? I mean, desire is a powerful thing, man, and not something easily turned away from. And just about UFOs specifically, it has always baffled me that a group of people claim another group of people have hidden things from them and outright lied to them for decades about this. But they want this same group of liars to validate their beliefs. To me, that sounds a bit silly and short-sighted. I mean, couldn't UFOs just be an occulted control mechanism? Anyway, if you missed the Patreon extension, Jason and I talked about how the work of Ray Kurzweil and ideas of transhumanism map with Whitley Strieber's work. We talked about the out-of-body metaphor, the human body, and space travel. More chatter on the subject of enlightenment through trauma and abuse. One of Jason's quotes here actually was, it's not worth breaking that many eggs to make such an impoverished omelet. We also talked about Jason's views on the concept of spirit and faith, the de-eroticization of spirit and trying to uncouple psyche from the body, implementing psychological fragmentation and installing psychological triggers and scripted behaviors on a mass level, and the dangers of accessing psychic realms in higher consciousness with a fragmented psyche. Interesting stuff, to say the least. Shout out to some new patrons, Lisa, Ingmar, and Hugh all hopped on board last week. And also a shout out to David and Jeremy for becoming official executive producers of the show. Much love to each and every one of you. Patrons also got a bonus mini pod of sorts from me this weekend. I recorded a, uh, a car cast while I was driving to my parents' house for the weekend. It's about information realities and the types of information we expose ourselves to that then construct our experience here. And this was inspired by a couple recent things I heard with Jordan Peterson and filmmaker Adam Curtis, and it pairs well with the recent episode with Gary Lockman and this one here with Jason too, I suppose. If you're interested in supporting this esoteric endeavor of mine, patreon.com slash occulture is the place to do that. Four levels of support with varying rewards, movie night, free merch, the private Discord server, chances to co-host episodes with me, and more. But anyway, I am epilogued the hell out here. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,
Kessler. 